chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 20. I'm your host, Otis Gyrie, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Finn McCool, Kitty Olson, Dominic Eagle, and Nikki Exposito. Tonight, we'll hear stories of perilous pickups, terrible trails, morose monstrosities, and scarring storefronts. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the Moonlit Trail... So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. <laughs> the show is about to begin. <laughs> you know the story about that thing, right? Sure, everybody does. It's that thing that shows up when you say its name. Or wait, no. I mean the story about that one thing that happened in your neighborhood. Wherever that neighborhood happens to be. Yes. Urban legends are just another part of the landscape of horror. And tonight, we're going to be digging into the world of the stories that just happen to be true. They have to be. Because didn't Jody down the street say it happened to her? Finn McCool once again graces us with the story of a late-night binge at the bar and of a phantom cab driver who may or may not pretend doom to those who ride with him. Thankfully... Just such a driver doesn't really exist, right? Without further ado, I present to you the Killer Cabbie. I never used to be one for urban legends and the like. I'm a cynic at heart and not prone to flights of fancy. But as you might have already guessed, Something significant happened that changed my perspective. The phrase, life-changing event, might sound like a cliché, but that's what happened to me on that fateful night a couple of years ago. I was going through a rough patch at the time, my life having spiraled out of control. After I lost my job, broke up with my longtime partner, and drinking heavily to dull my pain. On the night in question, I was partying at a nightclub in my local town center. I started on the beers and moved on to shots, and I might have consumed some illegal substances to boot. Much of the night went by in a bluesy blur. 
I tried to chat up a couple of women with little success and took solace in downing yet more alcohol. At one point in the evening, I found myself sitting in a quiet corner and speaking with an acquaintance of mine. Let's call him Jack. This guy was a regular at the club and liked his drink as much as I did, and he was the sort of bloke who I could hardly stand when I was sober, but could just about tolerate when drunk. And when he was buying the drinks, Jack was my best mate in the whole world. We talked and drank for some length of time, how long exactly I can't recall, and when I say we talked, really it was Jack who spoke while I listened. Jack was, and presumably still is, a big fan of conspiracy theories. I mean, he's one of those guys who's in them in a big way. He would yap on for hours about the secret cobbles who ruled the world, how vaccines were used for mind control, the moon landings were faked, lizard people walked among us, and so on. Like I said, I'm a cynic, or at least I was at the time, so I had little interest in his outlandish theories. Instead, I merely nodded, feigned interest, and occasionally came out with a, oh, really? or a sarcastic comment as he continued to get the drinks in. At some point in the one-sided conversation, Jack moved on to the topic of urban legends, another area I had very little time for. I tuned out for much of his rant, but did start paying attention when Jack started talking about the legend of the killer cabbie. What the hell is that? I asked incredulously. Jack smiled before answering, knowing that he'd hooked me in. The killer cabbie's a local legend. He operates right here in our hometown. I laughed before responding in a mocking tone. What? Something interesting happened in this dump? I exclaimed. Oh, you'd be surprised what goes down on these streets after dark, Jack answered cryptically. I rolled my eyes dismissively. So, this taxi driver's a serial killer or something. Funny, I didn't hear anything about a murder spree on the news. This time it was Jack's turn to laugh. You believe what the media's telling you? Wake up, man. Besides, this guy's smart. There are no bodies and no proof that a murder has taken place. But isn't it strange how many missing person cases there are in this area? Yeah, sure, buddy. We've got a secret killer on the loose, but it's all being covered up. That makes perfect sense. I shook my head whilst taking another sip. I was sure Jack was talking crap, but he wouldn't let up. This guy's much more than your average killer, he said, in almost a whisper. For one thing, well, not everyone he takes ends up dead or missing. Some make it home, but they're not the same. What do you mean, not the same? I exclaimed in disbelief. Jack shushed me, looking over his shoulder before continuing. I mean, like they've been through something that's changed them forever. They've seen things we're not meant to see, things that'll haunt them to the grave. I'll confess that Jack's words brought a chill up my spine, but I soon dismissed my first instincts, Dismissing the story as the hogwash it surely was. Well, I gotta hand it to you, Jack. You've really outdone yourself this time. As tall tales go, that's a whopper. Jack seemed annoyed at first, but soon recovered, slapping me on the back as he said, Mock me all you want, old mate, but you'll come to see things my way in the end. Another drink? And the night dragged on. I lost track of Jack, had drunken conversations with some other folk, and before I knew it, the lights were switched on and the bouncers started rounding up punters and herding them out towards the doors. Closing time. I cursed, realizing that I'd let time get away from me. Before long, I was pushed out onto the pavement along with the rest of the rabble, bearing witness to the chaos which always took place in the streets at this ungodly hour, as all the pubs and clubs shut at the same time, and all the drunken revelers piled out onto the streets. I witnessed the typical Saturday night scenes, a group of rowdy lads piling into the kebab shop, a scantily clad girl puking in the gutter while a friend held her hair back, 
and two middle-aged men fighting over a taxi. I groaned, realizing that I'd stayed out too late and hadn't pre-booked a taxi home. I took out my phone and tried my ride-sharing app, but there were no cars available. Next, I tried calling a couple of the local cab firms, but they didn't even answer the phone. Then I shook my head and realized I was screwed. I had two options at this point. Either I wait here in the cold with all these drunken lunatics, or I walk home, which would mean trekking ten miles through some pretty dodgy neighborhoods. Neither option was in any way appearing, but I didn't see that I had another choice. And then, suddenly, I was thrown an unexpected lifeline. Across the street was a solitary taxi, an old-school black cab parked adjacent to the pavement with its lights on. I saw the dark silhouette of the driver sitting in the front, but there were no passengers in the back. It seemed too good to be true, and I was sure the driver was waiting on a fare. But none of the drunken revelers approached the vehicle, and it almost seemed like the cab was invisible to them. So I decided to chance my arm, crossing the road and approaching the driver's side before tapping on the glass. The driver lowered his window ever so slightly, not so much that I could see his face, but enough so we could talk. I guess I should have found this suspicious, but those five sheets to the wind, and not thinking straight. I did feel some apprehension, however perhaps thinking back to Jack's story and wondering whether there was maybe some truth to it. It was the driver who prompted the conversation, speaking in a deep and raspy voice. Yes, sir. Can I help you? He seemed a little too polite for a late-night cabbie, which threw me off for a moment, but I eventually found the words to reply. Uh, Yeah, mate. Can you take me to Hilltown, top of uh, Croft Road? Sure. No problem, sir. The driver replied quickly. Well, this struck me as odd, and I suspected he might be planning to rip me off. How much? I inquired. How much you got? was the answer. I clicked my tongue before replying. Ten quid. Sure, that's more than enough. Hop in, my friend. The offer seemed too good to be true, so I suspected there was a catch. I put my hand on the coral door handle and froze as the sixth sense told me something wasn't right. I didn't really believe this driver was a killer, but I did think he might be trying to rob or scam me. My instincts told me to refuse the ride and walk away, but then I glanced back across the road and saw the chaos had escalated as the fight between the two men had drawn in others, with punches being thrown and bottles getting smashed. I didn't want to stay here a moment longer, so I made my decision and opening the cab door and jumping inside. I'll confess that the alarm bells didn't start ringing straight away. I took my seat and slammed the door shut behind me. In fact, I was relieved as we drove off, leaving the mayhem of the street behind us. Feeling satisfied, I sat back and enjoyed the ride. But even through my drunken haze, I could tell this was not a normal taxi cab. First, there were no seatbelts in the back, and secondly... The reinforced glass between me and the driver didn't display the taxi man's name, license number, and photograph, as should have been the case. As for the driver himself, he was focused on the road, and I could only see the back of his head. Also, I noted how there was no meter on the dashboard. These details concerned me, but not overly so. I guessed that the driver was unlicensed, but that was okay with me as long as he got me home safely but I did get worried whenever he missed the turning to Hilltown. "'Hey, mate, you're going the wrong way,' I exclaimed. "Uh, "'No, I'm not,' the driver replied with confidence. I was now sure this guy was taking me for a ride, driving the long route, so he could charge me a higher fare. He must have thought I was too drunk to notice, but I was having none of it. "'Listen, pal, you need to turn this cab around,' I said. "'But we don't turn around. We only go forward.' was the driver's puzzling reply. I was taken aback by his words, and I started to panic, not knowing what to do next. Staring out the window, I saw inexplicable sights, which only increased my anxiety. At first, I witnessed familiar scenes, streetlights, late-night businesses, 
and the occasional other car on the road, but soon these signs of the modern world disappeared, and I bore witness to empty roads and crumbling buildings which I did not recognize. There were no other vehicles in sight, no lights other than the cab's headlights and the dim illumination from the moon and stars above. I was awestruck by this bizarre development and wondered whether I'd accidentally consumed an hallucinogenic drug during my drinking session. I prayed for a return to normality, but things only got weirder from that point onwards. Soon, we left the town altogether and drove down a lonely, narrow road leading through a dense forest. The trees on either side of the road were shrouded in darkness and appeared sinister and foreboding to my weary eyes. I stared into the black, becoming transfixed by the sight, as my exhausted brain attempted to make some sense of the craziness. But the longer I looked into the darkness, the more I was mesmerized. I felt like I was staring into an abyss at the edge of the universe, and so I was both terrified and fascinated in equal measure. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I swore I could see movement just beyond the tree line, shadowy shapes darting between the tree trunks and fleeing whenever they saw the car's headlights. I looked closer, focusing on a solitary shadow who glared out at me through the darkness, flashing a pair of eyes that were a deadly shade of demonic red. My God, I swore, jumping up from my seat in terror. Where the hell are you taking me, I shouted. I'm taking you home, the driver calmly replied. Assuming that's where you want to go. I shook my head in dismay, having lost all patience with this dodgy cabbie. I shifted over in my seat, trying to open the right side door and then the one on the left. Both were locked. I cursed as I pulled my phone from my pocket, my hand shaking as I entered my security code. But guess what? There was no signal. At this point, I lost my head. I banged my fists and kicked my boots against the reinforced perspex glass that separated me from the driver, screaming, Let me out of here, you bastard! The driver's response was instant and terrifying. He turned his head, and allowing me to see his face for the first time, and it was horrifying. His eyes were not those of a human being, but instead they were jet black, like you'd see on a shark. He glared at me with pure fury in those godforsaken eyes before opening his mouth to reveal a gaping hole in the voice that came out of his mouth. Well, it was deep and demonic. Shut the hell up and sit down, he screamed. I recoiled in horror, shrinking back into my seat and not moving an inch. I couldn't bear to look into his demonic eyes, but thankfully... The driver soon turned around and focused on the road ahead. I sat back for some time, frozen in shock, as I tried to come to terms with my terrifying predicament. Eventually, I plucked up the courage to speak through quaking lips. You're going to kill me, aren't you? I asked, thinking back to Jack's tale and realizing it must be true. You'll kill me and make me disappear just like all the others. The driver surprised me by laughing aloud. <laughs> no, sir, I'm not going to kill you, he answered. I've never killed anybody, and no one disappears unless they want to. I took a deep breath, frustrated by receiving yet another nonsensical answer, and I still feared for my life, as I believed the creepy driver was more than capable of ripping me to shreds. But I think the cabbie must have read my thoughts based on his next question. You don't believe me, do you? He asked. The words almost stuck in my mouth, but I answered nonetheless. No, no, I don't. The driver laughed again. Well, I can't say as I blame you, sir. I guess you need some more proof. Let's make a quick stop. Within a few moments, he'd pulled into a lay-by by the side of the road before he shut off the cab's engine and headlights. He scanned around nervously, seeing nothing but the darkened forest on all sides of the vehicle, and suddenly I reached a new level of raw panic. Uh, what the hell are you doing? I exclaimed fearfully. Just wait, was the driver's only response. 
My eyes widened and my heartbeat quickened as I saw the dark shapes emerging from behind the trees. Moving slowly at first, but quickly, gaining momentum as they crashed through the undergrowth. Turning my head, I saw others approaching from the other side of the road and realized we would soon be surrounded. The first slammed his white palms in the glass, making me jump and yelp in fright. I looked up to see a zombie-like figure with dead eyes and a filthy maw filled with rotten teeth. He screamed like a maniac as he continued to violently bang against the car's window, desperately trying to get at me. And suddenly there were others, a half dozen zombies at least, all dressed in ragged clothes and screaming blue murder as they assaulted the vehicle from all sides. I was overcome with terror, whimpering like a coward and rolling myself up into a protective ball as I prepared for the end. But suddenly the taxi's engine burst back to life and its headlights illuminated the scene. The zombies didn't react to the light moving away from the vehicle as they shielded their black eyes. And then the driver slammed his fist in the horn, emitting a loud and piercing sound that overwhelmed the zombies' senses and forced them to retreat back into the forest. Thus satisfied, the cabbie drove off and rejoined the lonely road. It took some moments for me to calm myself back down and recover from the shock. Once again, I was able to breathe, and I asked one question through trembling lips. What are those things? I demanded. Those things were once people like you, the cabbie confirmed. They're the ones who didn't make it. I felt a sickness rising from the pit of my stomach as I faced this new existential threat. Was I going to become one of those damned creatures? Was this to be my fate? Am I dead? I eventually whispered, dreading the sound I would receive, but realizing that I must find out the truth. No, the driver answered coolly. Well, not yet, at least. But you have an important decision still to make, one which will determine your destiny. I don't like the sound of that, not one bit. But I was a prisoner in the taxi cab and certainly didn't fancy any chances in the forest, even if I could make it out. To my horror, I realized I was completely at the driver's mercy. We drove on for some time in complete silence, my eyes drifting to the sides of the road where I could see the dark shapes continuing to move between the trees as if they were tracking our progress and waiting for another opportunity to strike. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be the end of the road, the vehicle stopping at a fork that offered two choices. To the left was a road that led up a hill that towered over the forest, and at its summit was a cross that shone brightly, its white light illuminating the dark night. I can't say what it was about the light, but it was calling to me, appearing like a safe port in a fierce storm. In that moment, I wanted more than anything to get to it. And the second road drifted off to the right, leading through yet more forest to an unknown destination. The enigmatic driver didn't turn left or right. Instead, he simply stopped the car and waited. What happens next? I asked nervously. That's up to you, he replied. This is your decision. I remained silent for a moment, staring up at the light as my heart ached and my eyes filled with tears. What's up there? I asked through trembling lips. Something extraordinary. Beyond your wildest dreams was his cryptic answer. Can you take me there? No, he responded firmly. I cannot ascend the hill. If you want to proceed in that direction, you'll have to do so on your own two feet. What? I cried incredulously. You want me to get out of the car? With those monsters still out there? I don't want you to do anything, the driver answered. It's entirely up to you, sir. There are risks in taking that route. If you fail, you'll be trapped in this place like the others. On the other hand, if you succeed... The rewards could be great. Reluctantly, I turned my head away from the white light and toward the dark road to our right. And what about that way? I inquired. 
Yes, I can take you down there, the driver confirmed. And what's at the end of the second road? The cabbie paused for a moment as if deep in thought. But when he did finish replying, his answer was typically vague. The road leads somewhere, not perfect, but familiar. I shook my head, my mind racing as I tried to make this impossible decision. As I racked my brains to consider my two options, I missed almost the two dark figures emerging from the forest, creeping ever closer to our stationary taxi. I need a decision, sir, the driver prompted. It's not safe to remain here indefinitely. The tension was unbearable. I sensed that this was the most important decision I would ever make, and in the end, I went with my head over my heart. I'm not ready, I whimpered. I can't go to the light, not yet. I swore I could hear satisfaction in the driver's voice as he replied. Very good, sir, he said. A moment later, he started to drive, avoiding the grasping, claw-like hands of the zombies, as he sped down the road to the right. I instantly turned around in my seat, looking out the back window over the heads of the undead, and casting my eyes upon the cross of the white light, watching with tears in my eyes until the light faded. And when I turned back around, I was astonished to discover that we were no longer driving through the haunted woods. Instead, the cab was on a city street, and not just any street. It was my home street. Seconds later, the driver pulled outside of my house, and I heard a sudden click as the doors were unlocked. There you go, sir, the driver said cheerfully. I told you I'd get you home in the end. Oh, and don't worry about the fare. This one's on the house. I was still in a state of shock, but relieved to be within touching distance of home and safety. And so I opened the door and stepped out onto the pavement, struggling to walk on my shaking feet. I stood there for a moment, trying to adjust my abrupt return to reality. I still had so many unanswered questions. But when I turned back toward the taxi, I saw that the cabbie had already driven off. I watched as the taxi proceeded down my street before it inexplicably vanished at the bottom of the road, seemingly disappearing into thin air as I rubbed my eyes in astonishment. My friend Jack had been right about some details, wrong about others. The killer cabby legend was real, but the otherworldly driver wasn't the killer. He was my savior. I don't think it's a coincidence that I ended up in his cab that night. I believe I was chosen. Whatever the case, my life did change after that fateful night. I sobered up and got my act together. I can't say that my life has been all roses since my paranormal experience, but things are certainly better. Still, I often wonder what would have happened if I'd chosen the other path. Could I have made it to the light, and if so, what would I have witnessed and experienced on the other side? I'm afraid these are questions for smarter men than me, and I'll leave you, the readers and listeners, to reach your own conclusions. So, take my story for what you will, my friends, and stay safe out there. I hope you enjoyed The Killer Cabbie by Finn McCool as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Finn dash McCool. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash F-I-N-N dash M-C-C-O-O-L. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. On the plus side, I feel a little bit better knowing that Cabby isn't quite the monster he's described as. On the other, I feel less comfortable about having to jog to a far-off sanctuary in a forest full of monsters. But, hey, once one speedrunner does it, suddenly everyone's doing it. A lot of the time, legends grow not because of the area itself, but because of the stories kids tell to each other. 
In this tale from Kitty Olson, we'll hear of one fellow's long-time encounter with one such tale from his friends in school and a long, scary trip through the forest. But just how much of the tale is true? Without further ado, I present to you The Ghost Trail. As an army brat, I had two options. Get dragged from place to place over the years, switch schools, and have to start from scratch when it came to making friends. Or I could go off to the boarding school my dad went to as a kid. I ended up picking the latter choice. I was 15 years old and moving all the time was stressful. I just wanted to be a normal teen, you know. And I was going to be at Chapman Academy for Young Men, all boys school. We wore uniforms, I had a strict set of rules to follow, and to be honest, I thrived in that environment. It was stable. I learned independence. I had to be accountable for myself, do my homework, and eat balanced meals. It probably didn't work for every boy in that school, but it did wonders for me. And I made friends, too. I ran with a small pack of other boys, Frank, Jesse, and Philip. Frank was the leader for us, always wanting to push the limits of authority, always wanting to stick it to the man. I didn't really join in on the rule-breaking, but I did watch some of his more outrageous stunts. He got into a lot of trouble, more than once, but he somehow always managed to sweet-talk himself out of getting expelled. I liked Frank. I didn't always approve of what he got up to, but he was a good friend. It was his idea, naturally, to try the ghost trail trick. He first brought it up after we got back from winter break. We were all chilling in Jesse's room. He was plucking at his guitar. Philip was talking about his girlfriend at home that I was fairly certain didn't actually exist. And then Frank turned to me with the biggest grin on his face. So Dale, since you're new this year, I bet you don't know the story of the ghost trail. That got the room's attention. Jesse and Philip notably perked up while I shook my head. I bet you're going to tell me all about it, though, I said. Frank laughed before he hunched over, like some deformed ghoul, and spoke in what I presumed he thought was a terrifying voice. It's the trail that leads to the nearby girls' school. Oh, during the day, there's nothing to fear. It's at night when things get spooky. Frank waggled his fingers and made some ghost sounds. Legend has it that the trail's filled with spirits. Dark, evil spirits. They can be summoned in only one way. There's a matching set of oak trees at each end of the trail. You approach one with a flashlight, aim the beam at the tree, and then turn it on and off five times. Legend has it the hair on your neck will stand up, You'll feel a cold breeze, and then you'll have to walk the whole length of the trail, because if you turn around, a ghost will claw your eyeballs out. Frank lunged at me, which startled me enough to nearly fall off the bed. I called him a jerk after that. We all laughed, and then we dropped the topic to talk about the hot girls that went to the academy on the other side of the trail. Well, we figured they were hot. None of us really got dates with them. We were all too awkward to really get any attention like that. We didn't talk about the ghost trail again until spring break. It was optional to return home during that particular break, and I wanted to spend time with my friends. So after some begging and pleading with my parents, they agreed to let me stay at the school during spring break. I think they were a bit grateful for it, honestly. They had their plates full with my little siblings. They'd miss me, but it'd be easier on them if I stayed at school. I wish I'd gone home. It was a lot of fun just chilling at the dorms. Philip's mom sent him what felt like a truckload of snacks and goodies. We played card games. We ran around the mostly empty campus like a pack of hooligans. And we were having a blast. Spring break was drawing to a close when Frank announced what we'd be doing that night. The ghost trail. We'd be bringing the myth to life. I was hesitant at first. Sure, I I didn't really believe in ghosts, but it would involve going off campus, even on break, 
We needed permission to do that. But Frank was so excited about the idea and he insisted that we'd have a good time. He even found someone to buy us some beers so we could drink and be merry. Jesse and Philip were just as hyped for this, so I caved. Besides, I wanted to drink and have fun with my friends, too. We got to the ghost trail of urban legend around 8 p.m. It was a bit chilly, but I had a coat on. I wasn't going to chicken out, thanks to a few shivers. Frank agreed to go first. The oak tree was just around the bend, and we agreed to space out our adventures about five minutes at a time. It'd be scarier if we went at it alone. We'd also do it without our flashlights on, uh, once we did the trick to summon the ghosts. Once we all met at the other side of the trail, we'd walk back together, probably laughing and trying to scare each other again. We watched as Frank disappeared around the corner. Through the tree line, we saw the flashes of his light and nothing. Five minutes went by, then Jesse and Philip argued about who'd go next. It ended up being Jesse, whose nervous laugh was not unlike a hyena's as he scuttled to the tree. Five flashes. Darkness. Philip and I were really feeling the quiet now. Frank was the loud one out of the group, and with just the two of us, it was mostly just weak jokes followed by long periods of silence. Finally, it was Philip's turn, and I think he was just glad to get going. He hightailed it to the tree, leaving me alone in the dark. I almost chickened out now that I was alone. No other boys to be brave in front of, but I stayed strong. Five minutes ticked away in my watch, but it felt like five hours instead. Once I assumed Philip had gotten far enough ahead, I headed to the tree. I'd never seen it before, but it was hard to miss. A large oak tree older than perhaps most of the trees here. I steadied my nerves, raised my flashlight, and clicked it on and off five times. The darkness seemed all the thicker when the light turned off the last time. I swallowed the lump in my throat and felt sweat start to bead on my forehead. My heart thumped so loud in my chest that I felt the whole world could hear it. Then, just like in the story, the hair on my neck stood up and I knew I wasn't alone. Fear kicked my instincts into overdrive. I spun around, flashlight on, ready to fight for my life. Only to see a girl throw up her hands and squeal in terror. I stared at her as I tried to convince my heart to slow down. She lowered her hands and stared back. She wasn't what I would have called pretty. Mousy brown hair tied in a braid, her school uniform a size too big. Clunky glasses, braces, a patch of acne on her chin but not nearly as scary as the supposed ghosts that walked the trail and tore out teenagers' eyeballs. We kept on staring for a few moments, and then we both burst into laughter. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to scare you. I apologized. N no, it's okay. I shouldn't have sneaked up on you like that. She twirled her braid around her fingers with a sheepish grin. Ah, uh, so you're starting the ghost trail, yeah? I just finished. Oh, really? Spy any ghosts, I asked. The girl shook her head, that awkward smile still in her face. Don't think I did. I think I spotted some other boys, too. Did they ditch you? Nah, we decided to go at it one at a time. Finally, starting to calm down, I flicked my flashlight back to the trail. You want me to walk you back to the girls' school? The girl lit up. I don't think she had many guys asking her to do anything, much less go on a night walk. I'd like that. It'd be less scarier that way. Oh, uh, I'm Robin. No, I'm Dale. Good to meet you, Robin. My heart was beating fast again, but it was for a whole other reason. Robin fell in pace with me, and awkward-looking or not, she was still a girl. And taking a walk with a girl, any girl, made me feel all sorts of butterflies. So, uh, you like school, Robin? That was the only conversation opener I could think of, and I immediately hated myself, forever opening my stupid mouth. And thankfully, Robin didn't find the question awkward. I mean, the actual classes? Yeah, I like those. And I like being in band. I don't really have many friends, though. I'm not very good with people. Is that why you immediately assumed my friends ditched me? Again, the awkward questions. But I pressed on. 
Your friends ditch you? Robin huffed, a few loose strands of hair falling into her face. Yep. She popped her lips quite loudly on the pee. It's not the first time. It's fine. At least I'm not a wimp. I made it to the end of the trail after all. Now I just gotta make my way back. I hope I can. You will, I reassured her. I mean, I gotta make it to your end, so we might as well make it together, right? Robin bobbed her head up and down, but her smile was less awkward now. Yeah, yeah, we can make it. I'm sorry, I'm probably boring you. I'm not asking you anything about yourself. What grade are you in? Do you like your friends? The conversation went on from there. Just fun small talk, really. I learned Robin played the clarinet and had some serious pollen allergies, which is why she agreed to walk the trail so early in the year, so she could avoid the worst of the pollen. She had a cat back home named Snowball. She also had a dad in the military, but she was an only child, and her mom died when she was young, so she'd been shipped off to boarding school ever since her elementary days. That sounded lonely, and I told her so. She just shrugged. Yeah, it is what it is. I don't mind. A few times, I almost had the guts to reach for her hand. I was a dumb kid. I'd never even kissed a girl before, so the whole holding hands thing felt as frightening as a marriage proposal. I didn't end up going through with it, though. My hands were so sweaty they probably would have slipped right through her fingers. At the very least, it would have grossed her out. Teenage fantasies, though. In the ten minutes we spent walking down that trail, I felt like we had a lot in common. So clearly, we were meant to be. We both liked to read. We both liked the same bands. We both understood what it was like to feel overlooked, me by my family, her by her friends. Her friends were a real sticking point for her. When Robin said their names, she almost spat them out with how angry she sounded. Marie, Carrie, Amy, Danielle... Robin kicked a stick and sent it flying off the path with the force. They only became my friend after we got stuck on a group project together. I ended up doing most of the work, they took most of the credit. And ever since, unless I want to eat alone, I let them do what they want. They don't sound like real friends, I said. I don't think so either, Robin admitted, kicking another stick before she seemed to sag under the emotional weight of being a lonely high school kid. But it's either them or no one, and really, what would you pick? Something kind of sucks, or nothing that sucks even more. I didn't have an answer for that, so I shrugged. She nodded. It's not the best, but when I graduate, maybe I can go to college. Find some real friends there. Now, what you going to study? Don't know. Maybe I'll be a vet. I still got a lot of time to decide, though. We turned the corner in the path, and I cheered as I spotted the girls' school through the tree line. It wasn't super close, but I knew that meant we were reaching the end of the trail, which meant this challenge was almost over and I could go back with the boys. We're almost done. See, you proved your friends wrong, Robin. Do you believe in ghosts, Dale? Robin had come to a stop behind me, not budging on the path. I turned and frowned. I mean, I did the challenge and nothing happened, so I guess I don't. Robin bowed her head before she gently pushed past me. Walk carefully, she murmured under her breath. It felt like ice was forming crystals in my skin, but I followed her. It was a good thing I, she warned me. Even with my flashlight, I just about missed the path, uh, which made a sudden turn to the right and going straight led right into a steep ravine. This is as far as I can go. This is as far as I got, after all. Robin stared into the ravine, keeping her face pointed away from me. I swallowed. What are you talking about, Robin? A soft sob caught in her throat before she steadied herself. When my friends ditched me on this path, they didn't leave me with a flashlight. I had to walk back completely in the dark. I was so relieved when I saw the school, I started running. I didn't see the curve until it was too late. Your friends didn't either. My breath caught. No, she wasn't serious. This was just a joke, and I was waiting for the punchline. But she didn't move. 
so I looked down in the ravine. The beam of my flashlight landed on three all too still bodies. Even with blood soaking their clothes, I could recognize their school uniform. Philip, Jesse, Frank. All three of them were at the bottom of the ravine, all of them too still. Two of them face down except for Frank. Frank's face was twisted in terror. The hollows where eyes were supposed to be, just gaping holes. Red dripping down his cheeks like tears. It looked like something out of a nightmare. It couldn't be my friends, could it? I'm glad you turned around. I didn't want to turn around now. The air was colder now. I could feel the wind biting into me like icy fangs. But I did. Robin was different now, or maybe she'd been different the whole time and I just wasn't able to see. She was bone thin, her features sunken, her skin drained of any color. Her glasses were smashed, but did little to hide the fact. Her eyes were glazed over, turning them almost milky white. Blood clotted on her forehead, sticky and dark. I didn't die in the fall, I just hit my head. Broke my legs. No one came looking for me. My father didn't ask why I stopped sending letters. My so-called friends were too scared to admit that they were the reason I'd been out here. It took me days to die. Robin tilted her head to the side, her tangled braid flopping back over her shoulder. They did come back, weeks later, but they didn't leave. I would have been happy to move on after I killed them, but I just made things worse for myself because now they're stuck here too. Robin sniveled and wiped away rusty tears from her cheeks. You know, Dale, you're the first person to ever look back at me. You're really nice. I wish we could have met when I was alive. She took a step closer to me and I froze up as she reached up to touch my cheek. Her finger tips were ice cold and ragged like she'd tried to claw her way up the ravine and just succeeded in ripping open her hands. She had to step on tiptoe, but she managed to brush her freezing lips against mine. You would have been a great boyfriend. Run. Don't look back until we get to the other end of the trail. The others? They're not going to be so kind if they get their hands on you. Run. I didn't need to be told twice. I bolted like a scared deer, nearly dropping my flashlight. I wanted to turn back to tell Robin... What? Thanks for not killing me? Ask her why she was sparing me? But I didn't. I listened to her instructions and I ran. The wind howled in my ear, sounding like the angered screeches of a thousand demons, or perhaps a troop of girls whose awful prank on the lonely robin would be their last. The other oak tree wasn't much further, but I was still sweating buckets by the time I skidded to a stop next to it. I was shaking so badly that I thought I was going to pass out. Now, on the other side, I allowed myself to look back. I was alone. Perfectly, entirely alone. The only thing I could hear now was a bird calling in the distance. I waited until morning until I made the trek back to school. I was not going back onto that path in the dark. Unlike Robin's so-called friends, though, I didn't wait to tell a staff member that something had happened. I didn't tell the whole truth. I didn't want to be shipped off to the crazy house. I just said we went out to the ghost trail, and I reached the end, but they never showed up. It didn't take them long to find the bodies. Cops had questions, but in the end, the case would just go cold. It was too strange to be natural causes. But there was no way I was able to get the drop on the three other boys, cut their throats and gouge out their eyes, all with not a mark on me or any blood in my clothes. I had just been a lucky survivor. I ended up looking up Robin. Sure enough, she'd gone missing just a few years before, but they'd only found her when they went to look for the other girls. By then, she was little more than bones. She'd been buried in a local cemetery... I went there once before I went home. It was pretty overgrown, but I cleaned it up. Left some wild flowers on the headstone. Told her thank you for saving my life. Told her I was sorry about what had happened to her. 
I was met with silence. But on the way back, I happened to pass the trailhead for the supposed ghost trail. It was just a second, a flash out of the corner of my eye. But I swore I saw a girl in uniform smiling at me. Perhaps she was thanking me, too, just for being her friend. I hope you enjoyed The Ghost Trail by Kitty Olson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash K-I-T-T-Y dash O-L-S-E-N. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. And once again, I would like to give a nice big thank you to all of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month. And get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. 
If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha ha ha!